Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Jeonakgum, where we explore the Admiral's Sword, a Korean Joseon Dynasty sword form by Lee Ru Song. If you haven't seen our previous videos, then check them out above. So today we're going to be going through the basic stances of Jeonakgum. How do we stand, why do we do it, and what are the basic postures, and how do we move our body for Jeonakgum. Now this is my personal interpretation, and if you disagree, then that's absolutely fine. And in fact, I encourage you to do so. Jerokum is your blank canvas to work around with it, play around with it, and make it how it works best for you. So I hope you can use this video as a pointer for making it into your own form. Alright, so let's talk about the stances of Jerokum. So if you're used to traditional martial arts like karate, taekwondo, kung fu, you're probably quite familiar with the basis of these stances and they just need a slight tweaking to turn them from an unarmed stance to an armed stance. Now the bulk of the form is in a long stance, so if you're used to a taekwondo long stance, then it's a very long rigid stance with the back leg straight, like this. Now this is a very stable stance, but the problem with this is it doesn't have much mobility. We can contrast this to the modern fighting stance, like this which is a less stable stance, but it's got a lot more mobility. Now the Jeonokgum long stance is halfway between both of those. So here, it's longer than your fighting stance, but shorter than your long stance. The back leg is still slightly bent, and I like to keep my heel off the ground, so that I can push off from here, so I can engage the hips, and I can move with it quite well. And it's also, it's not it's not like you're standing on a line. It's a little bit wider than that, so that you have a little bit more wideness to your base and gait. Now let's talk about the second stance in Jeonokgum, and that is horse stance. If you're used to karate or taekwondo, horse stance is a very front-on stance. Like this, with the weight sunk low in the hips, knees bent, often they say feet facing forward, um, but this one, it's a very stable stance, but it's got basically no mobility. And being front onto your opponent like this, if you're cutting with a sword, doesn't really help you. So we use horse stance as a stance that you step into. From here, step into horse stance. Weight is low and it transfers that mass very effectively. The other thing it does is it allows you to spin quite well. And the third stance that we come to with footwork is back stance. If you're used to the Taekwondo back stance, it's a very low backward stance with most of the weight on this foot, the foot pointing out 90 degrees, this one to the front. And that's good, but it doesn't have much variability. So what we're going to do is we're going to widen that stance a little bit, have that foot pointing a little bit more to the front, so it's not 90 degrees or backwards. And what that allows you to do, if you put, say, about 60% of the weight on this back leg, is if someone attacks your front leg, you can lift it out of the way. And then you can lift it, and then you can cut. So that the mass transfers to the front, and so you've got a shift of mass from the back leg to the front. Now after we're done talking about legs, we get onto upper body. What does your upper body do when you cut? In cutting, then you want to engage your core and your hips so that the body mass is added into your cut. And that happens a lot with the footwork as well as with engaging the core, tightening it and pulling in the mass into the cut so that your body weight goes forward with the cut. And for the actual arms themselves, cuts come from the shoulders and also from this push-pull motion with your hands for your cut. Now if you cut from your elbows, then it's a smaller joint, you can get more injuries, and it doesn't have as much power and mobility as the shoulder. It's a bit of a bigger motion, and it might leave you more open, so sometimes you might want to do it from your elbows, but most of the time, generally speaking, cut from the shoulders. And finally we get to stepping. There's two types of steps, there's alternating step and there's the skipping step. In both cases, when you step, then it's not like you're walking, like this, where there's no mass transfer, a step should engage the hips and the core and put mass forwards into your cut so that the, the step is really useful in getting that cut to have its power and its form. 
In an alternating step, it sounds as it does. You step left, right, left, right. Left, right, left. Now in a skipping step, it's slightly different because your feet stay in the same orientation. That is, if the right is in front, after you're done, the right is still in front. How you do it is that you lift up the front leg and you push off from the back leg so that you step and then the back leg follows. So go back, step. And this way then you have a lot of momentum into the cut without changing your legs. So that's about it for the stances and steps of Jelakum. I will go through it in more detail for their particular stances later on in this series. So that's it for today. Thank you for joining us on today's episode. If you check down below, you can find a link to my writing, my transcript, uh, which has the original form as it's practiced in Korea and also my interpretation. It's completely free. If you want to share it with your friends, go ahead. If you could, give this video a like and a subscribe and I'll see you on the next episode.